Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this questions answered video, the question was, how can I get my loved ones to take training seriously and take practice seriously? Well, you certainly, uh, certainly aren't doing me any favors with that question. This is a hard topic to pin down. But here's my strongest advice. Boyfriend, husband, girlfriend, sister, brother, does not equal firearms instructor. Even in my personal life, I take my own medicine. Uh, those are the, those people who are closest to me, uh, my girlfriend, mother, father, brother, cousin, whatever, I will not teach them in a professional setting because there's a personal relationship that exists there, a domestic relationship that exists there. And as an instructor, that could mean one of two things. Either I'm going to be harder on them than I should be, or I'm going to overlook something that I shouldn't because I want to avoid any kind of conflict. So if you're trying to teach your wife or you're trying to teach your husband, you're trying to teach your girlfriend or trying to teach your boyfriend how to shoot or how to do something defensively focused or just any, any real functional instruction in general, uh, you have to keep in mind that personal relationship can cloud, confuse and create um, conflict within that, that block of instruction. Uh, it's very hard for us, especially, you know, it's very hard for some guys to realize that they're trying to teach something that maybe they don't have the best grasp on. Just because you grew up shooting doesn't mean, that doesn't make you a firearms instructor. Any more that just because you were a cop makes you a firearms instructor or your infantry makes you a firearms instructor. Teaching is the biggest part of teaching firearms. Firearms is not the biggest part. When people say, hey, I can shoot, I'm like, congratulations, you have your pants on. You can learn how to shoot well to a certain degree by yourself. You can you can work your way through that methodology and become a reasonably good shooter, but can you transfer your knowledge to another person and get them to the same level of performance? Uh, mostly, the, the answer is probably no, otherwise there would be way more firearms instructors than there are, and there are a lot. Um, it's nice to be able to impart knowledge upon our loved ones, our kids, our wives, our brothers, our sisters, our husbands, our boyfriends, but in an instructional setting, it is kind of, it can be significantly detrimental to their ability to learn or their desire to learn or their willingness or enthusiasm about learning because it becomes more of a chore or a domestic dispute in a way than it does an actual, uh, I guess, holistic learning setting. When I was a training officer for police department, I had two cops that were in no way, shape or form, gun guys. Uh, there's some officers out there that believe, well, you know, I'm not a gun guy, it's just part of the job. And that's, that's entirely true, that the firearm is part of the job, but it can be the most critical part of the job because it's what you may use to save someone else's life or your life. So you need to be, you need to be good at it. Uh, as a police officer, you have to accept that that's a condition of employment, like you need to be good with your guns. And these two guys just really didn't do it. Now, it's not saying that they were, they were wrong. Their mentality was perfectly acceptable outside of their profession. If you want to go out into the world and have no means of equalizing a defensive situation in your favor, then that's your choice. You have that right to, to make that choice. But occupationally speaking, they didn't have that right. Even though they were trying to make it like, hey, well, nothing's ever gonna happen, so I don't need it. I'm just gonna shoot my qualification, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the bare minimum, and I'll be on my way. Because everybody wants to meet the bare minimum in a gunfight, right? You wanna just like, you know, I just need to survive. I don't even need to win. So survival equals wheelchair, uh, paralyzed, lost an eye, lost use of an arm, whatever. They're, they're okay with that minimum level of uh, success. And to them, success would simply be surviving. Or, and realistically, these two guys probably just would have ran away or not drawn their guns and just died. Because they weren't gun guys. But they were so not gun guys that they didn't even want to train. It wasn't just firearms. They didn't want to train on anything. They were just there for the paycheck. And there's three types of cops, and that's one of them. Uh, they're literally there to get paid. Um, their quality as a person may be beside that. They may be a good person otherwise. These guys are good dudes outside of law enforcement. Um, no work ethic, so that's an issue. And no desire to better themselves occupationally. So I have dealt with this on a professional side. Uh, I've dealt with it on a personal side too. How do we motivate people? And that's the question. How do we motivate people to train? And there is no one answer to that question. The best advice I can give you is you have to find a way through your personal relationship with this person to let them know that owning and being proficient with a firearm is the only way, the only way that they can take personal responsibility for their own life and the life of anyone that they choose to protect. It's the only way. There is no other option. Mace, taser, none of that's going to work. Knife, coup baton, baton, like 
all of those things presuppose a certain level of force of which you're going to face. Mace is great if it's just a grabby guy in the park and you can just spray him in the face and jog off. Like it's movies have been doing it forever. That's one of the most popular tropes when it comes to women jogging through the park. A little Mace in the face unless we know like, hey, Mace is a good thing. That's all I need. But it presupposes that your attacker is just going to be at a level of force where Mace is going to be acceptable to use. Can you spray Mace at a guy who's 25 feet away and he's got a gun? Probably not advisable. Uh, these factors need to be considered when we think about the weapons and the, the tools that we're going to use for armed self-defense. And some people, and this just isn't women, there's plenty of guys like this too, uh, they'll carry just a pocket knife. Like, hey, I got a pocket knife, you know, that's, this is my level of protection because that's what they're comfortable with. They're not good with guns, maybe they don't own guns, maybe they grew up in a house where there were no guns. And that's becoming more and more common as we become more of an urban society. You're having more and more people grow up in households where there are no firearms, where literally it's either uh, explicitly or implicitly implied that we'll just depend on the police to protect us. We'll call 911 and everything will be okay. Because as a society, that's kind of how we're raised. If you think about going back to your school years, fire department, EMS, police, probably less so now because there's a big social movement against law enforcement, separate conversation, uh, that we were taught in schools, like these were, this is how we handled our problems. In an orderly fashion, we would depend on some facet of the government to provide us with services that would protect us or help us if we got injured. That goes against the idea that only you are ultimately responsible for your own safety. Uh, if I was, if I had a girlfriend who wouldn't carry a gun, then I would be responsible for her safety. If she depended on me to be responsible for her safety, then she's made a significant grievous mistake because I am not always going to be there. And this is the point that you have to get through to your loved ones, be it friend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whoever it is. You need to find a way, and I can't tell you the way because you know them better than I do, I don't know them at all, to have that conversation and say, look, like no hyperbole, no, no, drama, this is the only way that you're going to be able to take personal responsibility for your own life. Like, I'm not always going to be there. Somebody else isn't always going to be there. You don't know in the situation in which you might need a gun. Some of the most, I could say, viciously uh, minded training individuals I know, people who just train no matter what, people who count pennies to feed themselves, but they'll just throw it out there for the training, are people who have come very, very close to dying because their training lacked. Police officers are getting shootings and realize the, the skills that their department gave them just aren't good enough. Those are the guys that'll go out on their own dime and train. People who've been had near misses of muggers or carjackings or home invasions or, or just suspicious individuals, women who've had to take restraining orders out against estranged boyfriends and husbands. These are the people that train, 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 practice, 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 practice. Because they got lucky. They got a buy. They had something happen to them which woke them up, but it wasn't so severe that they lost their life because of it. So First thing to do is identify the need for the training, identify the need for the practice, and then find a way to relate to their own desire to not die or not get hurt. You're statistically more likely to need medical training than you are firearms training. But since the question was focused on uh, self-protection, uh, but it really applies to any topic. You know, everybody should have at least a basic first aid class and understand like, hey, how do I stop bleeding? Or what's the best, play what's the best way to apply pressure? Or how to recognize some symptoms of trauma? Uh, how do I apply a tourniquet? You don't have to go all TCCC, although that is a, a good route to go if you want to invest the time and take a, take a class from a reputable instructor, but the basics are where we need to start. And once a person realizes that not only is training not that difficult, not super mysterious, and it's actually, the skills are easy to gain if you invest the time and you take training from reputable instructors and you don't try to find the royal road to success, because there is no shortcuts. You have to put in the time, and sometimes people's, sometimes people have a moral uh, disagreement with with training, and sometimes people have a time disagreement with training, and a time disagreement practice, or a monetary disagreement with both. And I understand that budgets are budgets, but there's a lot that you can do, and a lot you can become proficient at without ever firing a single round. So you got to find a way to have that conversation. An armed society is indeed a polite society, and not because everyone fears each other because everyone understands that we're now all on an equal playing field. If you are in an environment that is firearms rich, you are less likely to have to need to defend yourself than you're in an environment where guns are historically not welcome. Uh, there is no 
roll of the dice penalty or a very, very slight roll of the dice penalty for a criminal to take action against a person in an environment that's historically gun free. I think everybody can agree with that. If you look at history, like the movies have kind of ruined this, but you look at uh, the Wild West towns like Tombstone and Dodge City and, and Sioux City and things like that, the amount of gunfights that actually happened was significantly lower than Hollywood would like us to believe. And the reason for that was it was an armed society, therefore it was a polite society. It wasn't that people lived in fear of each other, it was just, it's just like, hey, there's a pretty good penalty for stepping so far out of line that someone could feel their life was threatened and then they can act against me and now I gotta get into a gunfight with a guy, which really I didn't wanna do that. So that's another aspect that we need to endear to people is let, make them understand like we're not trying to give you a position of machismo or a position of violent uh, superiority. Just trying to level the potential playing field. I'm Aaron Cowell with Sage Dynamics, train accordingly.